quick introduction, first of all, National Trust for Scotland, established 1932. Um, we think it's about the third largest landowner at the moment-ish, somewhere within that region. Um, we're currently doing um, a project where we're trying to quantify what we've got. We think we're somewhere over about 11,000 archaeology sites at the moment, so it's quite a, quite a large sort of portfolio. I mean, you can see from some of these examples here, we go from historic buildings, designed landscapes, Second World War, um, crashes, crash sites. And this is my favourite archaeology site for the National Trust of Scotland, Keith Stain in Edinburgh. And the Trust owns that bit of land just there. It's <laughs> <laughs> quite nice. And um, actually, we're just uh, doing a uh, 3D, uh, uh, 3D photographic model of this at the moment to put on the website. So I just quite like the idea of, of Druids being able to dance around it in, in their own homes. That's quite good. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so it's a historic environment in its broadest sense. Uh, but just to sort of give a quick definition of that as well. Can I use this to click on? Yeah. Oh, other way. I like to use this guy. Okay. He was once asked, how do you, how do you define the environment? And he said, the environment is everything that is not me. <laughs> it, was, it was Welsh, I think. So. <laughs> so the historic environment, because you're all my historic environment, this building is my historic environment. So it's a very, very broad remit. But the way that we kind of, we sort of dig into it, certainly in my mind, is it's not people stupid. So we're looking at the past, we're looking at history. We're looking at archaeology like this. This is a, you know, an enclosed uh, sort of group of people. This is Belfast and this is a, a peace line in Belfast. This is a bounded community as well. And this is Glasgow in the 1960s, and again, this is a bounded community. It's about looking back, it's about people, it's about defining how we have relationships together. Okay, the princess. So this, how do I do the thing? This is St. Ab's head. And this is St. Ab's head. <laughs> <laughs> so, Princess Eber, born about 615, we think, uh, the daughter of Aelfrith, became the first king of Northumbria in about 604. Um, Aelfrith was subsequently killed in battle in 615, and his family were exiled to Dalriada, John was just talking about that side of the country. It's there that the family converted to um, Christianity, and they're reputed to have been baptised on Iona. There's quite a sort of geographical <coughs> connection there. Around 634, Aelfrith's um, son, Oswald, retook the throne as a devout Christian, and um, you know, sort of, he's, he's well known for um, sort of introducing Christianity into sort of Northumbria and um, invited Columban monks over from Iona to um, found the monastery on Lindisfarne. A lot of people have heard some of this background before. This is the, the follow up to a talk that was given a couple of years ago by Wessex Archaeology um, on St. Anne's. Um, this is kind of the sequel. So everyone knows that Empire Strike Fight was back then. So, I thought that would go down much better. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't hear what you said. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mumbling, mumbling, doesn't matter. Um, at the same time as this uh, monastery on Linda's farm was, was kicking off, it said that his sister, Ava, um, established a monastery somewhere within the vicinity of what is now known as St. Ab's Head. Uh, so why do we think this? Not a great slide, but the idea is based on this uh, written evidence Mainly the Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, and then a couple of other um, stories of St. Cuthbert as well. And the story goes that St. Cuthbert visited Abba's monastery, um, and then at night he would go down and he would um, pray um, sort of in the water um, at the foot of the cliffs on which um, Abba's monastery was, was based. And that's kind of the key thing that people have been tussling over, this idea of the monastery being um, sitting on a, on a cliff top. Um, The writing also talks, it uses um, different texts, use different terms to refer to Abba's monastery, using this Birig, Burraberg, and Herbs, um, all of which can be translated as fort, and that's really important as well in establishing the supposed site of the monastery when we come now to look at the archaeological evidence. Now, back in the early 80s, the Alcocks um, did some investigation into the site, um, and they excavated um, an enclosure. Um, up on the, the top of the hill, I'll point out in a bit. Um, 
what they did was they, they, they got three really low carbon dates from this um, from this live bank enclosure around it. And from that, they interpreted two phases of activity. The earliest one being um, this, this hill fort um, activity. And the, the later two dates, they aligned with the historic text and interpreted it as um, a monastic valor, so a, a closing um, bank um, for the monastery. Um, but one of the things that we've talked about now for quite a few years is this idea that Coldingham, just near um, St. Ad's Head, they've got the more famous uh, sort of later medieval priory. Um, why couldn't it have been there? Well, quite frankly, it could have been. Again, if you, if you take sort of the historic text and the place names, um, we're either looking at the village of the settlers near Collard or the village of the people of Collardsburg. Again, you know, Coldingham. So it, the historic text is also pointing in that kind of direction um, for, the, for the site of Abe's monastery. So this is the hilltop. So this is the large bank that the Alcocks excavated and got their dates. You can see this nice east-west running, tempting chapel type building. This is known as Kirk Hill. And then you've got this enclosure around here. So the next thing that happened was both Edinburgh Archaeology Field Society in Wessex um, have done it. <coughs> geophysics on the site, and that's given us this absolutely fantastic plot. This is upside down for, for so it relates to the previous photograph, it's not that I'm rubbish. <laughs> um, so you can see, so in here we've got the east-west structure, we've got the enclosure, but then we've also got all these other really tempting geophysical <coughs> targets. We've got possible linear division here, we've got color stores in here, we've got some really, really tasty results. So we went to have a dig, and we found virtually nothing. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> um, what we did find was that most of the geophysics was we, we <coughs> simply didn't didn't pan out as being archaeological. Um, it's not that I'm poo pooing geophysics. I'm poo pooing geophysics done on a volcanic cliff. I think we've probably learned um. you know quite a good lesson there. Um, what we did find was that rectangular building, the uh, the supposed chapel. Again, not a huge amount, not 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 substantial remains um, in the either. And this is bad slide number one. I've got two awful slides. This is the first one. What we were finding was we did have um, animal bone below that supposed chapel. That animal bone was conforming to the Alcox original kind of period of, the, of this enclosing bank kind of. Um, area that they had interpreted as an ecclesiastic valor. We then have these later dates and the, um, the actual finds themselves are fitting into a later period which conforms to the period of the development of kind of Coldingham as being, you know, this is the, this, this sort of religious centre as well. So we're starting to see more, you know, more activity certainly in that medieval period. Um, I'm going to flash this up but I'm not going to talk about it. Because it's, this is all work that's been done at Coldingham um, by sort of local people. I think Heaven did some work there. Durham University have been working there. And we're starting to, and, and I'm certainly now I'm convinced that Ava's Monastery you know, is located at Coldingham. But what's happening, we've got this really interesting relationship where we do have this outlying chapel sitting up on St. Ab's Head. Now, in a kind of religious and political context, what that chapel, that outlying chapel, is doing is it's tying together this history of Lindisfarne and Eber and the Anglian sort of hierarchy and history with Coldingham, which is actually founded in relation to Durham. So you've got a big political connection via these stories and these archaeology sites. So that was the first Next, flying through, um, I'm going to talk about the slave. Now, this is a bit of work that AOC carried out at Inverest Lodge, um, at Inverest. Now the garden was open to the public, but the house is one of our um, let properties. But unfortunately there was a fire um, last year, um, which meant that the family had to um, be evacuated. And we had a lot of repair to do, but there's the opportunity to get in there and start analysing this building. And it's, it's an opportunity we've not really had before. Um, she said it before. <laughs> um, if 
many of you have not been involved in a historic building survey before, um, it's just the same principle as digging, except there's nothing, there's nothing mud. Um, you just look at the layers of the structure, what came first, what came next. Um, and Diane Spro at AOC did a cracking job and established uh, 15 different phases uh, within, this, within this building. Um, there was a really handy gate above the doorway, uh, 1683, which is quite nice. Uh, and it had always been assumed that that was, obviously, you know, the, the, the building date wasn't at all. The building's actually much older. Um, there's at least two sources that talk about the building originally being constructed um, by the monks of New Battle Abbey, which just sounds a bit bonkers. But then when you look at some of the map evidence and you see that you have this direct kind of riverine access down from New Battle up into Inveresk, it doesn't seem, you know, quite that fanciful. Um, and then you know, the building, you'll see later the you know, um, sort of building research as well, sort of born out some quite early dates, which is quite nice. The more kind of map evidence you can see, 1682, you're starting to get this classic kind of ribbon development with, you know, presumably small cottages and built in rows defining um, the roadway. And zip on a little bit more. By um, the sort of 1740s, Inveresk is becoming um, quite a desirable location for the construction of villas. So you've got the rich sort of new town Edinburgh folk who are then starting to establish second homes um, at Inveresk. So that we've got these kind of countryside um, views. And you can see, sort of just about make out here as well, we've got this ribbon. If you go to Inveresk now, you can still see opposite the, um, the garden, you know, the cottages are, are still there. And then you've got a lot of these um, villas that are built in the back, taking advantage of all these, these countryside views right the way across. So it's quite a, quite a complicated little, little set of buildings. And then this is your classic and given and Ross um, illustration. So we looked at the building fabric, um, had a good look at all the rooms, I like this one. This is the, uh, it's been known for years as the Macintosh suite, uh, it's not, it's not. Um, I think that this has actually been fitted out by a yacht fitter, and then there's been these kind of Macintosh kind of tweaks being added afterwards, which is, which is quite nice. But this is quite a simplified plan. Originally you've got this kind of two-story possibly, um, kind of hall, before the, the date still was sitting next it predates that. Then you've got the addition of the stairway with the date stone of 1683. And then you can see this development uh, kind of through time, so it becomes a more, more complicated building. This is bad slide number two. One of the things about the villas is that they tended to change hands quite regularly. You see on a lot of these uh, buildings, they, they, they didn't have a sort of longevity of, of family ownership, and they did, they did swap around quite a lot. The, the, the sort of social importance of Inveresk Lodge came, sort of became apparent after this building survey. We start looking at some of the um, inhabitants and owners. Um, the Bruntons are well known in Musselburgh for the Brunton Wireworks. And um, there was a lot of outdoor work done on that as well over the years when it was, um, the site was developed. Um, huge amount of population of, of that side of Edinburgh employed in the Brunton Wireworks. Um, in the 1900s onwards, there's a brilliant video on the National Library of Scotland website of an old documentary um, of Brunton and White works in the classic sort of black and white, people moving through quickly kind of way. It's, it's really, really good. It's well worth watching um, if you're into that sort of thing. But I'm going to talk about the Weatherburns uh, again because it's this kind of this, this, this people, um, sort of importance of people and quite an unknown kind of international um, importance. Um, for this family. Now, the owner of the house, um, his father, um, James um, Weatherburn, no, sorry, James was the owner. His father, John, was hung, drawn, and quartered. This is John, in 1775, for his part, his involvement in the Jacobite Rebellion. His two sons, uh, James and his brother, they fled to Jamaica. James declared himself a doctor in Jamaica, having had no medical background <laughs> also, um, and worked as a doctor and then became a plantation owner himself. His brother was eventually the largest plantation owner in, in Jamaica um, and made a huge amount of money. James made his fortune and after 25 years came back to Scotland and purchased Inveresk Lodge for a thousand pounds. Now while he'd been in Jamaica, um, he fathered quite a few children by his house slaves and one of these was Zama. Um, eventually had a son, this chap, Robert Wedderburn. 
Not so often, no. And Robert um, gained his freedom when he reached adulthood. Joined up as a, as a fighting seaman with the uh, the Royal Navy, and um, worked his passage to England. When he arrived in England, he travelled to. Um, he became well. Became first of all, he was engaged in kind of political struggle for um, in the anti-slavery movement, uh, which at the time wasn't massively popular because there was a real kind of um, sort of socialist workers' movement in Britain, and if you were campaigning for slaves overseas, you were actually viewed quite often as neglecting, you know, your own kind of your, your own the plight of your own workers at home. So it was, it was quite contentious. What Robert did was he sort of unified these groups by. Um, creating this idea of, uh, of the Atlantic working class. He took the, the, the struggle uh, the, for, the, for the British working class and he compared that to the struggle um, of the slaves in Jamaica and, and he sort of unified the, the, the two groups who were, who were pushing for the abolition of slavery and for workers' rights in Britain. Um, he's, he, over, the, over the years he kind of became more and more extreme and became this uh, sort of, uh, uh, quite a revolutionary. But the event that, that, that triggered his, his, his sort of revolutionary urge was he, he actually travelled to Inveresk and he knocked on the door because he wanted to meet his father. And his father wouldn't speak to him and the butler gave him a cracked sixpence, half a, half a glass of beer and kicked him off down the road. <laughs> so in terms of thinking about this building, the biggest impact that this building has had on our society is by the chap who wasn't allowed in. He was excluded from this building and he turned away and he started writing things like the earth was given to the children of men, making no difference for colour or character, just or unjust, and that any person calling a piece of land his own private property was a criminal. And though they may sell it or will it to their children, it is only transferring of that which was first obtained by force or fraud. He was really good at that kind of thing. <laughs> so it's also quite gratifying to think. Um, that he did live um, to see um, the abolition of slavery act in 1833 and the sort of parliamentary reform act of 1832, and um, died in Porter's grave. He was last sighted in 1834, and nobody knows. So almost definitely died in Porter's grave. But as I say, in terms of you know, we can look at a building as quite a cold mechanical thing, and we can analyse it that way, or we can look at it as being somewhere that these kind of biographies have played out. And as I say. His, his rejection from this building in Veres has a massive, massive implication for you know, British social history. That was the slave. And to the weaver. Right. Oh, we okay. This is the House of the Bins in West Lothian. Just near Linlithgow. Uh, this is how it looks today. Got this kind of gothic um, sort of redevelopment. You'll all have seen this from the from the motorway kind of driving past. It's just obvious landmark and then this is the estate as it's, it's on today. Hope Tomb is just to the east of it there. Um, it's the house of the Dales. This is Wee Town. It's a big town. And this is Bloody Town. This is actually it's the first house that was handed to the National Trust of Scotland. Um, so it's the first thing that was in our portfolio. This is Tam chuffed to bits, his mum's handing it over to us. <laughs> um, bloody Tam again is quite, a, quite an interesting character in his own right. Um, he fought for Charles I. Uh, Cromwell placed 200 guineas on his head, dead or alive, and he ended up fleeing and fighting for uh, Tsar Alex I in Russia in the uh, Turco Christian Wars and everything. So he was quite a, quite a fighter. Yeah. So we've been doing work here. This is just quick um, sort of lidar plot of it, um, just showing some of the sort of interesting features you can make out there. It's the turning circle in front of the house, the ha-ha. <laughs> um, where the tower stands on the hill, there's, local, there's a lot of story of it being a Pictish fort sitting on the hill. Yeah, it's pretty fairly unlikely. Um, but then we start to see odd things as well, and you knew, yeah, it's, it's, it's the landscape that, that needs more attention. But the thing that really caught all right. Was while well, I was on a, a, just an inspection um, last year, going out and looking at the condition of some of these buildings, we came across a lot of human remains eroding out of what was um, an old quarry space on the estate. Now, if any of you know Derek Alexander, head of archaeology for the National Trust for Scotland, 
Um, normally I have a little thought bubble coming out of his head there saying, look thoughtful, then ask Daniel. But I thought I'd take this one more seriously. <laughs> so this is what we have. This is the, the, the quarry face. A lot of stone has been quarried on the estate for various different buildings. Um, and there is, a, there is an, uh, an account from 1875 of a uh, kist having been found somewhere in the vicinity of this quarry. Um, that's, that's as close as I can, I can identify it. But the skull that was found is in the National Museum collection, and that was, that was carbon dated about five years ago, I think, which came up with a date of, 14, of about 1496. That doesn't make a lick of sense. You know, for a kiss barrier, really. Um, so, <laughs> don't know what's going on there. Um, but as I say, we found this poking out what had happened once, and this, this had obviously been there for you know, 100 years or so in, in terms of when it was last quarried, um, and then it's been dislodged by grazing sheep and a lot of human remains starting to, start to tumble out. And this is what we were finding. So, kiss barrier, we've got one, two, three, and there was a fourth slab that's been dislodged. Um, this is cut, this is box shape, cut directly into bedrock, hacked vertically straight down with these upright slabs placed in it. We've then got two individuals in there. We've got one, the first one bobbed in, presumably was laid out, bobbed in, it's been squished to the side, and then a the second individual put in there in the kind of classic crouched uh, position. Again, just to sort of give you an indication of, the, of that, that kind of style of things. So, what do you actually get? Now, I'll apologise for the names of these individuals. Because this, this, this was written into the osteology report and the actual um, C14 samples were sent to the lab, I found out, with these names as well. So it's got stuck in the record now. I originally just said East and West, but osteologists are weird people. <laughs> Sorry, <does> I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and This is all pretty new, actually, so I am going to refer... Some of, the, some of the notes. So the easternmost of the two, which again, if you look into so that's the one on the right, because north is always up, as everybody knows. So there's, there's been dated at 40-ish, male, about five foot six. Uh, with pitted lines on the lower canine, indicative of severe illness, at the age of about seven. The westernmost, this side, you can see we didn't have much, you know, in terms of the thing we've got a fair bit. Um, 20-ish year old male, about 5'5", five five, but interestingly, had unusual uh, linear wear marks on the outside of the upper central incisors, and these were abrasion marks. I'm doing that. There you go. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can't really make them out, but in here, and I think running across here as well. Um, both of them had these unusual anomalies of the upper legs where the muscle attachment line, which should be at the back, was actually further around to the side. Suggested, the osteologist suggesting that these were bow legged gentlemen who were also pigeon toed. So they want to, they want to stop to pig in an alley, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but they both got exactly the same deformity, and this isn't, uh, this isn't due to a life way or anything, this is, this is inherited. Um, and then we've got the C14 range. No idea what that means, so I got my clients out and did this. Right, so this is the range of one of them, this is the range of the other. There's a slim chance that they actually overlap in terms of their, their, their lifetime, I think, if I can sort of wrap my head around it. So we've got the same sort of, <coughs> sort of inherited deformities, they're in the same burial, are we looking at? A, you know, father and son relationship, or at the more extreme of the date range, we're looking at a grandfather and a grandson relationship. Also, so in, in the kist itself as well, we had this brooch preserved, again, which AOC has done a, a cracking job with. Um, AOC are also they're in the middle of analysing this brooch and trying to sort of fit it into a into a chronology. But the uh, but Dawn, who's been doing this, went down with a burst appendix halfway through. So I got a report that was like, <laughs> <laughs> the really exciting thing as well as the brooch was that in the kind of concretions and the crud around the brooch, we actually had the imprint of the fabric of the original cloak that the individual was buried in. 
So that's been analysed as well. And um, so we, we can actually start to um, see um, the, the weave of that fabric. It's been identified as a coarse sort of wool. Um, and one of the things I'd like to do is kind of link up with some of our um, properties. And um, we've got weavers who work for the trust at, at some of the sort of historic weaving um, buildings and things and see if we can start to reconstruct some of this stuff. Um, so the report tells me that this the brooch itself um, is quite a rare find. Oh no, sorry, the the the, um, the fabric is quite a rare find um, in Scotland, and most of the sort of Iron Age date fabric that we do know of is, comes from East Yorkshire and quite the quite fancy burials that, that they've got there. Um, so the deceased was wearing a cloak and um, sort of buckled on the uh, left shoulder. Um, it's also one of about 50 Iron Age burials um, sort of containing grave goods in Scotland so far. That's where we think it's kind of fitting in. But as I say, it, it's quite ongoing. What I like to do though is, is wax a bit spherical and be a bit philosophical about this idea that, you know, if we've got this family relationship within this, within this Iron Age grave, um, and we've got this kind of this weaving, we've got evidence of the fabric, we've got these wear marks on the tip, are we looking at some kind of sort of Iron Age um, appreciation of you know the sort of the, the magic of transformation of the craft person, and that's why they they've given this kind of status of the kiss burial. There was a talk at the first millennium um, lectures in Edinburgh the other week, and again the lady was talking about East Yorkshire and about um, burials with weaponry in them, and about how you know the weaponry <coughs> could, could equal power within society and status and all this kind of stuff. I sort of like to spin it the other way and think actually the transformative power of the craft person could well, you know, be the thing that gets you status within society, within a sort of non non-violence environment. So again, I think this is quite an interesting example that we'll keep we'll keep looking at. Um, and in terms of the, the wider estate, so the burial was in there in this little quarry site. As I say, we've got a lot of these humps and bumps and things going on on the hill now that we need to look at. So we need to start thinking a bit more seriously, you know, about sort of the wider environment that, that this, these two single burials have, have been found in. All of this information can be found on Canmore. We're now right directly into that with our commission. Um, you can find us on the website and you can follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much. Good.